By the time they graduate from high school, 70% of kids will have drunk alcohol, half will have tried an illegal drug, and about close to that many will have smoked or vaped nicotine. One in five will have used uh, prescriptions off-label. These numbers are critical because one of the primary factors in developing substance use disorders is early exposure. It's a fact that the majority of people who have a substance use disorder began using before they were 18. For instance, if you start drinking by 14, you have seven times the chance of developing an alcohol problem than you would if you had waited until you were 21 or longer. So why do kids take these risks? Well, they're primed for those risks. And in fact, through most of our evolutionary history, high risk-taking and novelty-seeking and low respect for adults and authorities have benefited the population as a whole. It's great to have a bunch of contrary risk-takers living alongside more cautious folks so that we have a balance between progress and caution. And these changes are also really good for them individually because it helps them to uh, develop their own identities. This tendency to experiment and take risks is built into the way the brain develops. There's a gap between the development of reward pathways and motivation, which happens quicker than those for uh, caution and impulse control and abstract reasoning. And that serves them, again, by helping them to develop their identities, and it serves the rest of us. About 10,000 people die every day from drug abuse around the world, and I should have been one of those. I took my first drink at 13 and was off to the races. I spent the next 10 years taking as many mind-altering chemicals as I could get my hands on. And as a result of that, I was um, kicked out of three schools. I became homeless. I contracted hepatitis C. And I ended up in treatment right after my 23rd birthday. I thought it was going to be a spa. This was in the 80s, so I had no idea what treatment was. But I, uh, I got to a treatment center, and they said there that if I wanted to live, I was going to have to be abstinent, which I thought was a terrible deal. I wasn't sure. But I figured there was a back way. If I had an illness that was killing me, I was going to figure out a cure for the illness, and then I would be able to use without dying. So I eventually got a PhD in neuroscience, and I've been researching in the field since then. And I haven't solved it, and nobody else has either. What we know is that addiction is characterized by craving and compulsive use, tolerance, meaning that the drug works less and less well over time, and dependence, so that when the drugs go away, you feel less good than normal. And those things are, um, are mediated by about half of it, the risk comes from genetics, and um, the genetic factors include things like those we've been talking about. So the tendency toward novelty seeking and risk taking is higher in adolescents than in adults, but in some adolescents more than others. Um, environmental factors include things like um, access and stress. Um, and developmental factors are really important. So um, adverse experiences early in your life really prime a person for developing an addiction as they use to cope, but also just any adolescent exposure really increases the risk. So to talk about what addiction is, I thought I'd give you this model and start with the idea that we have a, a feeling state a homeostatically maintained baseline. So if I bumped into you on the street later and I said, how are you doing? And you said, I'm doing fine. That would be your homeostasis. Yours might be different than mine, but we all have one. This is really actively maintained by the nervous system. And it's necessary so that we know if something good or bad happens. For instance, if it's your birthday and you have a great day, um, you'll feel better than that. And that's how you know, you know something wonderful has happened. I don't know if you've noticed, but the day after your birthday is usually a little bit of a letdown. You don't go right back to your middle baseline. That great day you had kind of comes with a cost, and then you return to baseline. The same thing can happen if an adverse uh, experience occurs. So you feel maybe worried or threatened. If that threat goes away, then you feel relaxed and especially cool before, again, returning to baseline. 
So basically we start with this homeostatically maintained feeling state that we um, kind of move around as good and bad things happen. And that's how we know if good and bad things happen. Well, some of us learn that alcohol and other drugs can cause changes in that feeling state to make us feel better than our homeostatically maintained baseline. But you'll notice probably that uh, even a drink or two has a little cost. It might be that you feel not quite normal or a little bit hungover or you don't sleep as well. And then you come back to your baseline. Um, but we don't have to stop with a drink or two, do we? So you could have more than one drink or maybe throw in a little weed and that would be better. So we can, we can control the delivery of these things. You can only have so many birthdays, right? Um, and you can even take more than just the alcohol and the weed and get really happy. So that seems great, except it's not from the brain's perspective. And the brain will adapt to cause tolerance so that you're not quite as happy and even um, eventually enough tolerance that you're really feeling basically normal with your drugs. That adaptation is to maintain the baseline and um, uh, that also happens when you take the drugs away is when you really notice it. So if you're now normal with the drugs, when the drugs are gone, you're uh, on the opposite extreme. So I thought we could take an example, um, one that's kind of close to my heart. I, my, I, I liked all the drugs I could find, but I especially liked smoking marijuana. And this is popular today, uh, about 40% of kids smoke. That hasn't changed in the last few years so much, but what has changed is that they're smoking more. So many more are smoking daily or frequently. And I thought I'd describe how marijuana works on the brain and how homeostasis is maintained. So marijuana works, THC is the active ingredient that produces the high and it um, activates this endocannabinoid system that we naturally have. So anandamide and 2-arachidonylglycerol, or 2-AG, are neurotransmitters that interact with all the black spots you're looking at all over the brain, all over the cortex, and areas associated with learning and memory, associated with motivation, associated with reward. And when those chemicals interact, they have an effect, obviously. Our brain wouldn't make these for no reason. I thought I would explain the effect uh, by telling you a story about my dog, my puppy, who's now uh, 100 pounds. But when he was little, he was walking around the front yard one day, and my daughter dropped a piece of bacon. And I could really practically see his brain light up. He didn't know there was bacon, certainly not living in the grass. And uh, I imagine that his olfactory areas and his taste sensory cortex, his reward areas, maybe learning and memory, all were activated with little squirts of anandamide or 2-AG to sort of let him know, wow, bacon, this is awesome. Um, the same thing happens for us. I don't know what your bacon is. It might be a great line of poetry or music or uh, some wonderful idea you have or a good talk but you'll release these chemicals to let you know that something really salient or relevant is going on. The reason this system is all over the brain is because we never know what exactly we're gonna find important. It helps us to um, sort what's important by sort of highlighting those uh, events or experiences that are particularly meaningful. And this plays a big role in learning and memory and it really helps us sort what we care about and what we don't care about. Now, THC is a little different, isn't it? Because it's not synthesized, synthesized and released uh, when we have great experiences. We just smoke it in a bong or a high-potency joint, and it goes all over the brain, and it all those, interacts in all those black spots. So, in other words, everything is bacon, which is a lot of fun, I think. Um, I loved that... Uh, you know, everything was so more, much more rich and meaningful. And even a tedious day at work could be interesting. Of course, the brain doesn't like it this way, because then you really can't tell when something important happens. So it compensates. And the way it does is illustrated in this picture of, again, rat brains. On the left, your left is uh, a rat that has had no THC or uh, THC-like analog. And on the right is a brain, all the way on the right, that had a high dose for about 14 days. 
And I bet that my brain, when I stopped smoking, looked a lot like the one on the right. And what it felt like to me was that nothing was really interesting. Nothing was uh, motivating, nothing was really worthwhile, time with my family, eh, you know, my aspirations, not so important anymore. The only way, in fact, that I could find anything worth doing was to be completely stoned. This happens to people who smoke a lot of weed. You can see in the green all the areas that uh, there's these uh, interaction sites are lost in uh, regular smokers. And if this is occurring during development, when meaning is so important, we're supposed to be trying new things and figuring out who we are, then the um, cortex is organized differently. Those effects in blue are probably permanent. And they lead to a kind of a different way of processing information. One important thing about the way we process information if we smoke a lot of weed is that what we used to find rewarding and pleasurable is no longer that important. So back to our model. It's fun to get high, <laughs> acute with uh, occasional use, but if you do it regularly, your brain is going to adapt, getting rid of those interaction sites, so that now you're not really high. And when the weed goes away, there's a lot of despair. Substance abuse is the number one killer for people under 50. And uh, if we take addictive drugs on a regular basis, they cause feeling states exactly opposite to the ones we want to have. When I started smoking weed, I loved how it made everything interesting and fun. By the time I quit smoking, nothing was interesting and nothing was fun. Thank you for listening.